If there were a lottery for which Sunday service one wanted to give (laughs) and which reading one wanted to respond to, this wouldn't be the one. (laughs) The question is so esoteric. (laughs) And of course the answer is yes. (laughs) That might be the shortest sermon in the whole year. As I pondered the question, did God create the universe? Did God become the universe? I prayed for guidance, and much came. And my biggest challenge was, how do I, where do I start? And so I'm going to start with a little story about my grandson, Hardy. And we're going to work backwards. So Hardy's five years old, and he is a kindergartner. And his family moved from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, to New Orleans. So Hardy had to go to a new school. He had already been in school, as children are these days, from the age of two. So as five years old, he goes to this new school in New Orleans. And um, I tried to get the feel, because I work in our school here. I'm very interested in schools, and I'm very interested in how my grandchildren are making their way through schools. So I I tried to get the feel of how was it going for him. And I said, Hardy, how's school? And he said, honey, that's what he calls me. He said, honey, if I don't mess up, it's okay. (laughs) And I was really bothered by this. And that was my first inkling that something was terribly wrong in that school and with him. And then I would speak to his mother, I'd say, how is Hardy doing? And she said, well, you know, he doesn't really get up for school like he used to, and he doesn't really want to go. And um, I've talked to the teacher, she's really hard to talk to. And so I put her through the third degree. I said, what did she say, and how did she say it? And (laughs) I'm slightly involved. But she got no satisfaction, and and my daughter is very, very good at navigating difficult situations. And I uh, told her a few things to ask, and nothing really changed. Hardy looked forward to the weekends, and that's not what you want with a child of that age. They're just natural learners. They're open to everything, the whole world. And um, so finally, I thought, and my thought daughter thought, maybe we need to change schools, because nothing was happening. And so last week, he started his new school. And I called up, I said, how did it go? She said, he's back! <laughs> the real Hardy is back. And I said, what's the difference? He said, she, he goes to school, everybody goes, hi, Hardy, it's so welcoming, everybody knows him, the fifth grade teacher, the coach, is, is also recruiting him for his teams, and so forth and so on. And, and the teacher, she said, she's so positive, so affirmative, she's just saying, oh, these are the sight words that the other kids already know, you know, take him home, he'll get it, blah, 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 and life is good. Now, why do I tell that story? Because as we do this reading and we hear about the two approaches to creation, God created the world, God became the world. It's very esoteric. And that whole creation story is fraught. There are many creation stories. I remember as a little girl, I had my first theological argument when I was about seven with the little girl down the street. And we were playing on this dessert. It was um, kind of an abandoned lot. And there were trees, and there were bushes, and we were playing jungle. We were swinging from those trees. We were monkeys, and we were burrowing in. We were other animals. Finally, she says to me, and we were really getting along, she says to me, you know, we all came from monkeys. And I looked at her, and I said, no, we didn't. (laughs) And she said, "Where, where do you think we came from? I said, we came from Adam and Eve. And I told her the whole story of the Garden of Eden. And she said, no, we didn't. My parents told me that we came from monkeys. And I said, well, my parents told me. And then I said, and I thought this was going to win the argument. I said, but the nuns told me. (laughs) That didn't make a dent. 
And so finally, in desperation, she threw her biggest weapon at me. And she said, my parents tell me that that whole Adam and Eve story is just a fairy tale. And I was shocked because I knew it was real. <laughs> so fraught. Well, of course, I grew up and we uh, read the Bible with greater understanding and studied and I knew um, the word was made flesh and the flesh dwelt and he dwelt amongst us and I and the Father are one and be thou perfect as the Father is perfect and with God all things are possible. You know, we studied theology, we read the Bible and um, I came to peace with that. But it didn't last that long. It wasn't until I met Swami Kriyananda who introduced me to the autobiography of a yogi and the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna's version of creation and God became the universe and is in every particle, every atom of the universe. Now, what does that have to do with Hardy? Well, Hardy and you and I Everybody are sparks of the divine. That is our truest, deepest reality. And when he went to school, and he had come from an environment that honored that in him, to an environment that did not honor it, that was always looking to the dark side, what was wrong, what had to be fixed, where did he make a mistake, instead of this child in front of me is a spark of the divine. This child is a soul. This child has that original perfection and goodness. And our work here, together, in this school, in this lifetime, is to turn that child and ourselves in the direction of the light from whence we came and to go home to that light. And without that consciousness, Everything gets more difficult, truly more difficult. I know how it works with children, being in the school, working with children day after day, and with their families and with their parents. And I see the miracle of what transforms a child when they're placed in an environment that has that understanding, that looks at that child as a soul full of light, full of goodness. And that's the starting point. Not as in my old Baltimore catechism, the soul depicted as a, a milk bottle that had turned dark because of original sin, not original goodness, you see. It's where you come at it. And um, over and over again, we get these examples that live out in our school that show us every day the truth of what I'm saying and of what this gospel or this um, reading is saying. Um, recently, you know, children come in from other schools from time to time for this reason or that, and usually the reason is because they're suffering in one way or another. And the most recently, you know, we've had a child who came in who was suffering from deep depression, very bright child, very, very bright child, but really had gone into the darkness with it. And the parents were so concerned in what to do. And she had been in a very pressured school where the academic rigor was the name of the day. And she just responded in this way. Two weeks after she was with us, in our vibration and with our orientation about what was important, two weeks the doctor said, oh, she doesn't need to come back. Let her go. I don't know what's going on at that school, but it's good. And, and then another child came, and he had a history of um, being too much alone, um, abandonment, and not getting that stimulation of being in an, a loving environment. And his way of working with that reality was to move through life like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> You know, he was going to make his presence known and he was going to speak out and he wasn't quite aware of anybody else's reality. And uh, the weeks are going by 
And as they go by, what you see coming out of him is that, that natural sweetness that was always there. So sweet. And that response. And yes, he still is a little bit like a bull in a china shop, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at where he's going. And, and we're going along with him. And it's in the right direction. And then, you know, you get a child like the one I had last week who tends towards stubbornness. They just want to be obstinate and uh, oppositional. And um, we all have those moments, don't we? And we were singing a song about Krishna, baby Krishna, Gopala. And afterwards, he just announced to his class, he said, well, I don't believe in God. And he waited for the reaction. And the reaction I gave him was to say, well, I said, do you believe in love? And he looked so puzzled. He said, what? And I said, well, do you love your mother and father? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, that's enough. That's the beginning. And the little girl next to me just zinged at home. She said, well, you know, Krishna is the god of love. <laughs> so the miracle of, that comes with understanding that we are these uh, sparks of light. We also have to look at ourselves as sparks of light because there is such a tendency to get down on ourselves and to buy into um, the version of ourselves that comes from what Swami calls those bundles of definition that uh, either from this life or from other lifetimes that limit our sense of potential, of divine potential. Oh, I'm no good, or I can't do this, or, oh, this is, this is really painful, you know, rather than to say, oh, I see my infinite goal. I guess I have to do whatever it takes to get me there. And so we begin the journey. Um, the, the, uh, the temptation to give in to this smaller self has to be fought with every time it comes up. Otherwise, it's going to limit us so much that we can't make the progress we need to make. And I've seen what happens with adults when they begin to see what their next step has to be. Um, about 30 years ago, when I was living at the village, I was working in guest programs. And so my job was to correspond with the people, make the arrangements for them to come. And when they came, to greet them and see that everything was in order. And I'm going to tell you about one woman, but she's pretty representative. I saw it happen over and over again. She was fairly extreme, though. Um, she came, and she had flown in from Manhattan, and she showed up. And she was a bundle of electricity. I've never really quite seen anything like it. It was just, she was vibrating with electricity. And that electricity was full of worries. Where am I going to be? How, how am I going to get here? Who's going to be there? When does it start? And it, <laughs> so I answered these questions. And when it all came down to it, the image that sticks in my mind uh, with her is her purse. She had this great big designer purse. And it was chock full of all the things she felt she needed. Well, when we lived at Ananda, hardly anybody carried a purse, to tell you the truth. But if we did, wherever we went, we just left it. I mean, we didn't guard it. <laughs> and she, we were going over to a program that Swami was giving, and she had her purse. And uh, we were I, probably in the dining room, I don't know. And I said, oh, you can just leave that there, because it was this big thing. And we were hiking. And she said, oh, no, I couldn't. And she grabbed it and she held it to her. And she said, no, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't. Now, I understand New York, Manhattan. I've been there. And I understand why somebody would hold a purse close to themselves. But she was at Ananda. <laughs> she was at the Ananda retreat in the Sierra Nevada foothills, where the vibration was one of openness and love and acceptance, where everybody was seen as a spark of the divine light. Only she didn't know where she was. But it didn't take long. It really didn't. That was Friday and Saturday morning. 
And then I watched Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday service, and then she came to say goodbye, and I hardly recognized her. She was so calm. She was so joyful. It was another person. And as I waved off, I said, waved her off, I said, will you come back soon? And she said, oh, I will. And I never saw her again. <laughs> but it doesn't mean she didn't come back. But I never saw her again. But I think now, 30 years later, where is she? What is she doing? How many steps has she taken along the way? Just last Friday, I was out there as the children were going home. And um, a parent of one of our, two of our youngsters, came up to me. And he had tucked under his arm... Uh, a copy of the autobiography of a yogi. And he says to me, he said, oh, I just bought the blue version. I understand it's the original. And he said, and I'm going to read it. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Good. You should do that right away. And he said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I can't do it right away. He said, I have to be in the right consciousness. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> This is one of those times where it's going to stay on the shelf. <laughs> so I said, oh, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you know, you're going to read that book many times if you're like me. Just read it now. And he said, well, he said, I am in the right consciousness right now because I'm talking to you and I'm here on the school grounds. And he said, whenever I'm here and whenever I talk to any of the teachers, I get in that consciousness. He says, I don't understand it, but I do. And I said, well... <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I accepted that because it's true. When you walk on the grounds here at the church or over there in the school, there's a vibration that comes from devotees who, like us, are gathered together, not just today at Sunday service, but who live these lives together in the community or coming to meditation classes, whatever your version of that is. And when that happens and when all of those souls are pointed in the direction of true home, light, love, joy, divine, something happens to the molecules in the air and you feel it. I've had it happen over and over again at the school. I once had a, a psychologist come undercover. And she walked into a, a meeting that was for prospective parents, and I was holding it. And she sat there, and she seemed... I thought, oh, wow, I've got a live one. We're going to get a really good family out of this. And then later on, after everybody left... She fessed up to me. She said, you know, I'm really not a parent. She said, I'm a psychologist. I'm doing my PhD over at Berkeley. She said, I, and it's in education, and I, I needed to... She said, but, this is the important part. She said, I knew, I've been visiting schools, she said, I knew when I walked on this campus that something was different. She said, I didn't see a classroom. I didn't meet a teacher. I hadn't even seen the children yet but I knew something was different. And I said, really? I, said, I thought, that's pretty good. <laughs> and she said, and then when I saw the children, I knew. Because they all have these shining eyes. And they're all happy. There's, no, there's a joy that is emanating from this particular physical spot on the planet. That's what she was telling me. And I couldn't disagree with her. Because overall, when you get a band of, in my case, teachers who are committed to this version of reality that we're living the dream and that the goal of the dream is to break through into the superconscious reality of God the Creator. When you have a group of teachers who are committed to seeing children as sparks of the divine, who are willing to start from that point of original goodness, not original sin, not correction, but rather moving in the direction of potential, growing into something naturally, joyfully, with support, then it literally does change the whole 
physical vibration. And it's not only that one person. Over the years, people walk on and they come to me and they say, something's different here. This is a school that is different. What is it? And they can't put their hands on it. And they try. I had one mother who said, you know, I pick kids up at other schools and they're not that happy. I come here and the kids are just joyful. And it's true. It's true. Now, do we have our downtimes? Yes, we have our downtimes. Of course, individually. But overall, when you have a community of souls who are united in their sense of purpose, in their sense of the purpose of life, then you have a weapon in your backpack that's going to get you through. Now, um, Last year, we put on a play uh, on the life of St. Joan. And in that play, we sang a song. And I was reminded of this song as I was thinking about this talk. Because, yes, we live in joy. Yes, we are positive and affirmative. And no, it doesn't mean that life is hunky-dory every moment. Because it's not. Because we have these tests that have been generated by our karma in this life, in past lives, because we misunderstood. We misunderstood the true direction. We didn't do the right thing, the highest thing. And so, you know, we're bumbling our way and we're getting there. Anyway, I, I loved this song. It just it started the play, for those of you who saw the play, and it ended the play. And it's, um, there's the one verse that says, I, the Lord of snow and rain. And this is right out of the Old Testament. Actually, these words are from the book of Isaiah, put in poetic form. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. That's the Old Testament God looking down, tried to help, couldn't get through. And he says, I have wept. For love of them, they turned away. So disappointed. Gave him a chance. And then he says, the song says, I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. And that's it. That's the life we're living. Our little hearts are getting broken here and there. Disappointments, challenges, whatever it is. Not to punish us, as that awful teacher was doing to Hardy, but to inspire us, to help us make the big breakthrough, to cut down those things that are keeping us away from understanding the truest reality, the only reality that we need to understand. That we are parts of the divine, that that's our destination. That is our destiny. And then it goes on. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? And that last line, whom shall I send, always brings me to tears in a way. When my father died, we sang this song at his funeral. And I had always uh, interpreted him as one of those people who came into my life because, well, it was God-given, right? He was a gem in many, many ways. A true blessing, as was my mother. But if you, that's the human level. But if you want to look at, at, at it at the, uh, the superconscious level, then you see, whom shall I send? Well, Krishna, Jesus, Yogananda, Kriyananda. Those are the messages of the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst it. If I hadn't had Swami Kriyananda, if I hadn't had Master in my life to round out what I already knew, I really would be so much more in the dark. Wouldn't you? (laughs) And that, for sure, is such a blessing. Now, one of the things that Swami Kriyananda did, because... We knew him, many of us, in the body. And if we didn't know him in the body, all you have to do is look at his work and read it, and you will know him. He put it into his music. He put it into his books. He put it into his classes. But when we knew him, he gave us the example of what it means to find our way home, home in God. I remember one time, well, 
I remember when he was going through his major, major tests. And I never, ever saw him give way to human reactions of whatever. He never became mean. He never became, you know, he never went to the dark side of that. He's always uplifted. And then one time, um, a time I will never forget, I uh, committed a great infraction. And um, I got in big trouble for it. It was, uh, you know, I made a mistake. And Swami was talking to me, and he did it with such great love. You know, he never minced words. You know, this shouldn't happen, this should happen. But I always felt his great love in the course of the whole thing. And then after that, I remember this one day, uh, I went up to the meditation retreat at Ananda Village to help clear the brush. There's lots of manzanita trees and they needed to clear. It was a big job. And so we toiled and toiled the morning away. And I'm feeling terrible. Uh, it's really one of the worst times in my life. And uh, it was almost lunchtime. Our habit was to break and have a meditation and then eat lunch. So the word was, oh, Swami's coming for lunch. Great. So we all went into the temple and I sat in the back row. Isn't this what we do? When we get out of tune, then we get the opportunity to get back in tune, but we take ourselves out of the game. I mean, so I sit in the back of the temple, and uh, all of a sudden, we've just started, Swami walks in, and I watch him. And he's looking around, and he sees me, and he comes over and he plops himself right down next to me. And do you know what my reaction was? I just, my whole energy went, shrank, went in. You know, we have that tendency, if we have done something, and we know we've done it, to make ourselves small, instead of making ourselves big and saying, oh, look what I did, let's go on. And I thought that was a huge, huge lesson for me, because I wasted an opportunity to sit with Swamiji in meditation, that close and just envelop his energy with my energy, if I could, to try that, wasted opportunity. Now there was another time, and I hardly ever tell this story, because it's really, there's a tendency to think it's about me, but it's not about me, it's about Swami. There was another time when I went over to his house, he was offering a satsang. There must have been 75 people in the room, his old living room, and he was sitting and I needed to make an announcement about the potato bar. It was a fundraiser. So I sat up towards the front. As a matter of fact, I sat right next to him. He was in a chair and I was on the floor. And I asked him if I could, after he finished speaking, make the announcement. He said, fine. So I was sitting there and I was so determined to have a good meditation, but I had forgotten my pillow. And I don't have a body that aligns itself very well with the floor. It's tough. But I was determined. This was my chance. And so I sat there, and with my willpower, I willed myself to calm my body and my mind and my heart and just to be there with Swami sitting next to me and to take advantage of that. We must have meditated for about a half an hour. And then Swami gave a talk, maybe 45 minutes. And it was an uplifting talk. I swear I can't remember a word he said. I do remember the feeling of it, the vibration of it. And then he said to me, oh, Helen has an announcement. So I got up to make my announcement. And I'm looking out. Swami's right here. I'm looking at all of you. Just imagine you're in the room. And as I start talking about this giant potato bar that we're going to have that's going to help fund the school, all of a sudden I begin to see these threads of gold come in and envelop all of the individuals in the room and tie them together and surround them and glow. It was, I could hardly talk. I am a person of willpower a lot of the times, and I had to will myself through that announcement. And afterwards, when I was finished, Swami said not a word, but he reached over and he put his arm around me and he pulled me right in and he held me. And I 
when I think of that, I, what I realize is this. Because of my putting my will to meditating, to aligning my being with that of Swami's in such close physical proximity, wanting so much to have just a little snitch of who he was as part of me, that my prayer was answered. Because what I got to see was what Swami saw whenever he looked out at us. And what he saw was not our faults. It wasn't the mistakes. It was that spark of divinity, that original goodness that is our heritage because that's how we were created, part of God. Let us never forget that.